I've lost my head again. Okay, it's time to finally get back to the Bridgeport. Welcome to part three. And I don't know how, uh, how many hours of uh, video this is gonna take, but we're gonna try to get this uh, part down to reasonable, I don't know, maybe 40 minutes or so. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna scrape the top of the knee and the, we're going to use a, a quite a number of ways. I'm not going to show you a lot of scraping. This is not going to be a scraping video. You've seen enough scraping. I've shown you enough scraping. There's lots and lots of just really superlative uh, videos out there on scraping. Um, and so the techniques that I'm going to use are nothing remarkable. I'm just going to be scraping this to true. What I would like to show you though is how do I know it's true? And what's the metrology involved? And this, this is the part that, in my estimation, sets apart, you know, expert scrapers from hacks like Many weeks have passed since uh, I last shot anything here. And we're just about done with the, just about done with this, the bottom of this saddle. So you can see the spotting. It's um, it's a little broad. It's even all the way across. I've got uh, about 50% contact. And I may do some more scraping yet. This is a little bit finer. But it's it's everywhere I need contact for what I'm about to do next, which is use this as an indication of um, parallel on top of the knee. So we're going to take care of that. We're going to get that knee flattened out, and then we're going to start working on the dovetails and maybe do a little more finished scraping on this. But I'm going to use this plus the straight edge. So I'm not going to rely on I'm not going to rely on this surface solely to um, judge the top of the knee. But you'll you'll see that in a moment. Let's uh, let's go out there and take a look at that. And it occurred to me that uh, when I lifted this knee that I neglected to um, provide any way to adequately lubricate these waves before I started moving this um, knee up and down. So I did, uh, I did put a little oil on it manually, just to squirt a little on top of the way and, and raised it up. And that's where I left it until I could get this oil situation straightened out because I don't want to be moving this around without lubricant. So we now have a rebuilt and I apologize for not shooting this, but I just I needed to get it done. So I completely rebuilt my uh, my Bijour one shot oiler here. It's all nice and shiny and painted now. It's been all cleaned up, and um, the only change I made it's I thought it was pretty well put together. The only change I made was I did notice that there was a little bit of goo in the cylinder that might have gotten in around that uh, around this stem here. And I did put an O-ring, not an O-ring, but actually a grommet. There is a spring. There is a spring under this um, this nut um, that pushes the plunger back down, and this this rod obviously goes through that. So I, there's a, now there's a grommet underneath there to uh, to seal that a bit of a wiper. So if anything does fall on top of this uh, on the unit, it can't get down into the pump. But uh, we cleaned up the uh, the sight glass and repainted the whole thing and put a little red around the uh, around the letters, make it pop. I picked red because of the red in the uh, sight glass it was already there, so it seemed like a good color contrast. And um, since we don't have the 
we don't have the uh, saddle on. This goes. This hose goes to the saddle. This hose was a mess, and I was going to replace this hose. I, I I did price it, but it was um, it was about seventy dollars to replace this hose, and it wasn't leaking. It wasn't like I needed a hose. It was just all crapped up from um, chips and uh, oil, dry cutting oil and solvents and God knows what and uh, had some overspray from uh, previous Rust-Oleum rebuilds on it so we took care of that so we machined up a little cap I have a little nylon uh, a little ni conical nylon seal inside of there to uh, seal the end of this tube until such time as I have a until I have a proper saddle to connect it to there's a distribution block on the bottom of the saddle and it works. We pressurized it last night, and sure enough, we have uh, we have a little schmoo running down, as we should. And uh, everything is lubricated and slides nicely. No leaks. I did have a a, a broken hose here. Um, we replaced that. I have about a couple of meters of of this tubing that I bought. It was actually broken out here. So that's been replaced and everything's working good. So minor progress on the uh, on the bridge port, but very, very, very important. Very important. That one shot the the uh, broken tubing on this one shot oiler was probably responsible for all the, a lot of the work that I'm having to do now. I think if this thing were oiled properly, it would not uh, have seen the wear that it has sustained. So much for that. Got the knee. Now you'll see my my little gauge here that <laughs> that I've made. This is um, let me see if I can flip this over. So you can see this has been this is this is all scraped. So I know this is true. I just checked it on my surface plate. All right, we have a little gauge there. So this gives me a rough, maybe rougher than I'd like. Um, this gives me a rough indication of what the uh, what the depth of the wallow is from front to back. Um, it's kind of hard to gauge that otherwise. So. <clears throat> this works for that. I don't know if it was worth all the effort scraping this in. But it's it's kind of a nice thing to know. Anyway, um, I was very surprised to find that it was about two and a half thousandths. Let me bring this down. And, uh, yep, here we're reading about 2.3. The other side's about 2.2, 2.3. So the the wallow, or the, the low spot where it's worn here, is only two and a half thousandths below these ends. Now, if we look really close, I hope this thing focuses closely. Um, you'll see a little spotting out here. So obviously, there's a high spot here. And I can attribute some of that to hammering because this has been beat on and it's got all kinds of hammer marks. I did go over this with a straight scraping blade, not a not a curved blade, not a normal scraping blade, but a just a straight edged blade just to take down all the high spots. And I, I went over it again with a file, I just sort of floated a nice file over it just to take down the high spots, kind of like stoning, but a little slightly more aggressive maybe. Um, not really to remove any metal except all these all these little dings, all these little hammer marks. I just wanted to get all the little crater edges down so everything was flat. Um, so nice and smooth. Don't feel any high spots or bumps. I do feel some holes. There's a couple of holes. Like there's a there's a real nice little score right there. That I'm probably not gonna do anything about. I will get in there and pick at it just to make sure there's no grit in there or anything harder than cast iron. But um, 
And if we go to the back, you'll see the back looks almost factory. I mean, you still see the you can still see the half moon uh, oil flaking and same thing on the other side same thing on the other side you get that that half moon beautiful half moon flaking nice contact all the way from edge to under the dovetail for about three or four inches on both sides which I was very pleased to see so I'm gonna start this I'm gonna start flatting flattening this out a little bit I'm also I'm also going to drop the knee and I'm going to compare the knee for squareness to the column and that's going to be an interesting um, that's going to be an interesting shoot as well let me show you what we're going to use to uh, check the squareness on the column I think you'll find this interesting what this is, is an Excello squareness gauge. And it uses a very nicely made precision dovetail. I guess you call it a dovetail. It's a way. Uh, it's not really a dovetail. Um, but it's got a uh, sensitive indicator with little carbide, carbide balls. And uh, you, there's a procedure for calibrating this. It's it's recently been calibrated, and it's it's quite accurate. And you're able to take a reference point with one ball and slide this up and down against a you know hopefully a straight edge, and. Um, has a plastic handle, uh, polished feet, very nice little instrument. Um, it's narrow enough that it will actually sit on the top of the knee, the, the, the base, and <clears throat> this is cool, it comes with its own ground and polished calibration standard. XLO Robbins right angle gauge. Um, it's a casting. I assume it's cast iron. Very nice fine grain cast iron, no doubt. Um, there's a little. This one is that locked? So it shouldn't be locked. No, that moves. So. Uh, little carbide ball nice little gauge ten thousandths indicator and uh, another sliding dovetail here and the reference gauge nice fitted case um, I've got it on a t-shirt be careful not to scratch it yeah I found this in a consignment store um, and they were asking quite a bit of money for it and it sat there and it sat there and it sat there and the store decided that they were going to close up shop uh, a lot of the stuff left the store, but this remained. So I made an offer, and uh, I got this for, I think I paid about $250 for this. And I was very glad to get it. So that's what we're going to be using to check the squareness of the top of the knee to the column, I should say. This is a 24-inch Kingway straight edge with the, uh, with, the, with the dovetail angle on it, which has all been finished and scraped now. It's all blued up. It's what I'm doing these impressions with. And I made a box for it. Very, uh, 
very snug fitting box nothing fancy just a box very utilitarian all right let's get this show on the road it's um, it's March 18th and it's high time I give you guys another installment on uh, what's going on with the Bridgeport not not that I've been doing a lot of of work on it I wish I'd, I'd I was much farther along but I, I have gotten some stuff done so uh, I want to give you an update this is not the completion of uh, part three that I would have liked so there will be more parts but I wanted to um, give you an update on where I'm at now and talk a little bit about metrology and how to measure the progress of your scraping uh, are things parallel? Are they square? Are they flat? Are they the right number of points? Uh, the, does it is it going to require uh, flaking for oil? And, you know, just all the the decision making things that go into uh, a scraping job. And again, I'm I'm no expert. I'm learning as I go, but I'm I think I'm learning pretty quickly. But metrology, like like. So many things, you know, like you know, even a even a simple paint job in your living room, you know, it's all about preparation. And uh, you know, the painting's the easy part. Well, it's easy to scrape metal, which is why I'm not shooting that anymore. Scraping, scraping. Um, I think we've gone over that enough. But now we got to start measuring things. You've got to know where to scrape, how much to scrape. So I think I'm going to uh, go over some of that with you even though it's not, we're not finished here yet, and uh, edit this together and call it part three. So, I apologize for the sound. I, I can't find my wireless mic. I don't know what the heck, I know what I did with it. I, I, I wrapped it up and said, oh, I got to put this out of the way before it hits the ground and becomes, you know, 12 pieces instead of two. And I tucked it somewhere. I didn't hide it in a drawer. I just kind of like, you know, tucked it up on a shelf about eye level. I have no idea where I put it. I can't find it. So, I apologize for the sound. So let's talk about this metrology. I'm going to, um, I'm going to zoom in here because you don't see my, need to see my face for this. So, um, let me do that now. So what I've done is, and I'm just going to shoot this with my phone and uh, edit it in a little bit later. So pardon the handheld mess. Okay, so what I've done is I've I've um, scraped this down, as you can see. And I've got blue from one end to the other. Now you notice I don't have a lot of blue in the middle because I have to get in under here and do a little bit more scraping in there. But I just, I wanted to get this to the point where it was relatively flat from the front of the knee to the back. So that I had blue everywhere. I wanted to take out this belly. I had a deep, I had a deep belly in here. And I wanted to get that out, and I did. Okay. Now, on this side, <clears throat> this side wore differently. I believe this is the side with the gib, and I suppose the oil flow was a little different around the gib. So I've got a little different kind of a wear pattern. I've got less wear on the inside than I did over there, uh, which is proving to be obnoxious because it's hard to get in there and scrape that, but I've been doing it. And I'm not quite I'm not quite as low on the front and back as I would like. Um, so I need to do some more scraping there. But I've decided to stop at this point and determine in the Z plane. I want to know that these two surfaces are in fact in the same plane meaning they are both parallel and flat relative to each other. So there's um, 
Now I have this this dovetail in the middle, this obstructing surface. And if you look in the Connolly book, I, I believe it's the Connolly book. Um, I'll put a reference down below um, if I can find a uh, a site for the Connolly book. I think I downloaded Connolly off of Scribd, which is a, a paid a paid service for uh, downloading uh, copyrighted documents and stuff. But I. It's about 50 bucks a year. I, I have found it worth that. I got the Connolly book to off of that. I got the Schlesinger book off of that. I got uh, the Moore book, uh, Foundations of Mechanical Accuracy off of that. So I, and, I, and a bunch of other things. So I, I, and I'm not, you know, I like Script D. What can I say? The, I'm not getting any uh, endorsements from them, but I, I like Script D. It would be really nice, really convenient if this surface were usable as a reference surface but I don't know that it is in fact I suspect it is not and in terms of squaring up all of the component the, the uh, surfaces of my saddle these machine surfaces were not used and they're pretty rough on here as they come from Bridgeport factory. Now I suspect they were relatively parallel to these surfaces, but they're not references. But for now I'm going to look at this. I'm going to see how much how much closer I am to removing that, that wallow. And wow. We are looking at I can get this down a little more. Looks like 17 tenths so 1.7 thousandths of an inch um, when I started it was uh, over 3 we were about 3.2 okay so we're getting closer there and if I go over there it'll it'll if I go over there it'll read zero it might be the, maybe it'll be two tenths Okay, but I know I got more scraping to do over here. So now comes the tricky part. Are they parallel? Now, if you look in the Connolly book, they'll give you a number of ways to do this, none of which I'm going to show you because I don't have a reference plane here. I don't have parallels to set up out here. Does they have another method that requires, you know, basically setting this up on a on a surface plate they have a, a flat casting so they can sit on a surface plate and measure the height from the surface plate to the to here that's not going to happen either so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take two one two three blocks and I'm going to start in the middle And I'm going to tell you some things that are going to get your head scratching here. And they've got me head scratching my head. But I think we can agree that if, if these two surfaces on the top of the knee are parallel, then the two surfaces on the top of the blocks will be parallel. But are they in the same plane? We'll get to that in a moment. But for now, let's just see if there's any difference from one side of the surface block to the other. That will tell us something. If one side of the knee is significantly higher, if one side is significantly higher and parallel, and I'm going to exaggerate that, I will have a condition where there's a gap, there's a dis distinct gap between this outside end and where it makes contact towards the center. Vice versa, if the other side is high, then I will that gap will be that gap will be on the inside. So as I slide this across, I can take a reading. 
And if I take a reading right on the edge of the block, it reads zero. So I know that that corner of the block is in full contact with my, my gauge bar. As I slide it towards me, trying to avoid the holes in the block, as I slide it towards me, there we go, and make sure that this end is down, I begin to read nothing. So this block this block is parallel to this bar. Doesn't mean that these two surfaces are at the same height, but this block is parallel to this bar. If I go over to the other side and look for the same thing, Now even if this was screwed up on this side, it would still be in contact with on one point, like the you know, one end of the block or the other, so it doesn't matter. So I have one point there. And now I'm gonna slide across. And as I do so, it's flat. I, I don't lose anything on my gauge. So I fall off the block. Okay. So, at the middle, where I know it's war, or worn, and low, it's flat and parallel. Huh. Let's go to the back. Now I'm going from best case to worst case here, because obviously I've already tested this. If I go to the back, I don't even have to slide the gauge over. I can hear I can hear a little clicking when I hit that block. There's a little gap on the end there. It's not much, but it's there. It's a little more on this. It's definitely more on this side. So let me slide this over, engage my plunger, and sure enough, at the edge of the block, I could be zero this. Not that you can see it. Alright, so I engage my plunger and it's zeroed on the edge of this block. So I know that that end, if, if that end is uh, not where it should be, it's going to be low. Hold my block in contact with the surface and slide this across. I drop one thousandths. I'm just about over the outside edge of this surface. And if I go a little more just to just to follow it, make sure it's a nice linear pattern, yeah, I'm dropping off. So this surface out here is drooped down. The outside of my this surface is lower than the inside. In the back, where I know it's factory or close to fact starting at very close to factory. And all the original scraping marks and, and, and everything were very obvious there. Let me pull it over this way, do the same thing. Okay, again, there's my very nice zero. And I hold the block and slide it across and oh, there we go gotta keep this end down, the bar is long and heavy okay so over here I'm reading six tenths as I slide it across okay I'm reading um, maybe maybe more, maybe eight tenths. So I've got droop on both sides of the rear of the knee. I've got some droop and I've got less droop here. Now, it's not a lot, 
but it's enough to tell me I have to stop scraping that back corner of the knee. Or do I? I certainly have to scrape some more in here. So this has got to come down. This inside edge has to come down. Um, I have to start rotating this surface in to get it plain. Now, that's a pretty good test, but it also doesn't tell me if if this is if this corner is just a lot higher than this side because that would give me the same indication it would give me what appears to be a drop on the outside if if that were simply higher so let's see how do we do that so I'm going to set you know a standard test indicator here on the uh, surface and you know I can slide it back and forth and I can I can watch the needle bounce up and down and all that kind of cute stuff. Let me zero it. But here's the thing. We already know that at the center here that these surfaces are parallel. And not necessarily at the same height, but they're parallel. They're in the same plane. May not totally be the z-plane or solely the z-plane, but it's, they're in the same plane. We know that because it's the only way that those two blocks on both sides could both read zero from sweeping them. They have to be in the same plane. So if I measure the relative height, from this plane to this plane, and I set this to zero, I pick it up, come around the other side, do the exact same indication, knowing that they're parallel, and if there's a difference in height, between the two sides, I will read twice that on my indicator. And what I read is, I'm just gonna, okay. what I read is three thousandths. Let me go back, make sure. I did that right. And it's back to zero. So there's about three thousandths difference between the two. And let me just confirm the direction of that difference. And well now it says two. I should probably slide it a little bit. Two. Two and a half. Okay. So the net difference is about a thousandth. It's positive. This side is higher. I'm going to mark that plus one and I'm going to show an arrow pointing to that side, plus one relative to that side. But it's parallel. Yay! Um, so what does that mean? If this is higher than that side, and they're parallel, then this is tilted up, and this is tilted down. And the tilting down on this side is very evident from the measurement I showed you earlier. At least it's evident at the back. But for now, I wanted to show you those two techniques which are getting me pretty close. I remember. Okay, one other thing I want to share with you is um, I have found, I'm, I'm 
getting rather fatigued in holding this uh, Biax scraper, which is, uh, this is the big one, this is the uh, heavy duty, and it's, it's, it's pretty heavy, I mean you can see it's in the size of it, it's, it's a substantial chunk of metal. So what I've done is I've added some straps. So I've got one strap that uh, goes from the from the uh, carry point in the middle. It's rather well balanced, right at that point. If I if I hold it there, um, it's pretty well balanced right at this point. And so I have one strap which goes from there to uh, to the back of the machine. This this gives me a little bit more. Down, out, down angle, and then I have uh, another strap that goes strictly this way. that goes strictly from that that sink, that individual point. So it's very well balanced about that point. And I'm slipping this over my shoulder like so, and uh, it enables me to hold all this weight and still have pretty good control and be able to, to you know determine my angle and the other thing that does is having the weight hanging here it <coughs> it kind of precludes me from moving the moving the tool around because if I move the tool around it's gonna it's gonna go up you know it's gonna swing uh, so it kind of forces me to move my body with the tool which is really a much better way to do it I mean you keep you know you get a little Less change in height, no less, much less change in angle. So uh, anyway, just a little trick. If uh, any of you are uh, thinking of using a biax scraper or have a scraper, make a strap. Um, you know, makes it makes it that much more a component of uh, of your physical self, and I think uh, gives you a little little more control and certainly a lot less fatigue. I. Uh, well, I'm gonna. Ex I've been, I've been scraping like a fool here, and I've been going largely by my 24-inch straight edge, and blowing it up and looking for flatness from front to back. And uh, originally, um, just to re reiterate quickly, it was obviously very low in the middle and very high on the ends where there was very little wear which is what you would expect. And we were concerned about how parallel these two surfaces were to each other and at the same height, obviously level, you know, relative to or square to the square to the machine and all of that. So taking various measurements, it, it quickly became apparent using using both the um, sliding my bar ac across the uh, one, two, three block. It became apparent that that these surfaces were tipped down a little bit. Um, now that was kind of weird because that wasn't what was occurring in the middle. In the middle, it was relatively flat, parallel on both sides, but the front and rear were tipped down. But these weren't the areas that were worn. So what's going on here? Well, the only thing I can think of is that there has been some movement in this iron. Castings do do move over time. How much I don't really know. Um, but I, everything I've read, I mean, they 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 are known to change shape very slowly, which is why a lot of things castings are aged before they're even machined. Um, okay, so that being the case. I went ahead and I scraped as much as I could just to get some of the gross irregularities in height down. And now and then I started looking at parallel. So here's what I'm conjecturing. <clears throat> the wear in this section in the middle of the knee here was kept relatively parallel because it was being worn while all the time the entire surface, the entire top of the knee, on, on a large scale, the entire top of the knee was changing shape. And I think it was both uh, uh, 
bowing a little bit, but more than that, it was spreading. It was spreading out, and this was consequently dropping off as everything spread wider. Um, but the, the only thing I can I can think of. So now here's what I've done. I have blued. I have put a, a, a light coat of yellow on the surface, and the reason why I do that is something that I learned from Richard King. Is you you give it an overall yellow so that when you go and scrape the high spots, once you scrape the blue away, you can go back and see where the blue was. You can see where you scraped, and you can come back the other direction and, and give it another another pass. Um, otherwise, once you scrape the blue away, it's all, it's all metal. So you give it a light coat of yellow first. Now the blue, you see the blue here, very pronounced on this outside edge, and if I, if you look under there, you'll also see a little bit of blue. And that's what's got to get scraped next to get this, to get the shape right. This is a little bit of blue, and it comes all the way back here. So I've got blue everywhere. The surface is pretty flat in this direction. Now, you'll also notice. I hope this camera picks up the color. You see some pink in here. Actually, you see pink and you see purple. What I did was, is I went and I got the saddle, and I, I did the saddle with red. It was kind of a heavy, not a real heavy coat, but you know, enough to get a good print. Uh, I, I'm not looking for 40 points per inch accuracy just right now. I'm just looking for high spots, low spots. So I put a good, a good heavy coat of red on there, and I came and I used that. As my as my reference surface because that scrape that has been scraped flat on a stone, on a, uh, a surface plate. So sure enough, when I slid that across here, it shows me what what my the gauge on my bar showed me, which is the middle section is flat. I have a nice I have nice red all the way across. This is scraped really nice and flat. Um, and as I as I come to the back it starts to lift up and I lose my red. But the weight has to be somewhere. Where's the weight being transferred? Well, the weight is being transferred in here. This inside edge is, is, is bearing all the weight when I slide it back and forward. There's, there's, let me see if I can... Um, you can see it. There, there we go. There's a little bit of red in there. There's a high spot there. There's another little, there's some more red there. It's, it's, it's probably very hard to see with this camera. Um, anyway, so that's got to come down in there. And the same thing on this side, I think it's a little bit, is it more obvious here? No, maybe not. Oh, there's some red. Yep. And how about back here? Oh, that's a very distinct blue spot. So that very inside edge, and, and this is also where the uh, where the gib sits. The gib sits over here. But you can you can kind of see there's some red here, but there's blue out here, but there's red on the inside. But this is very flat. This area this area is relatively flat. This spot continually comes up, shows up high. Um, so yeah, more scraping to do. We're, we're, we're pretty close. We've got things relatively flat, but more importantly, the left and right sides, and this took a while, the left and right sides, uh, it took a long time to get them to the way they were in relatively the same plane. Because when I started out, yeah, I found out that I had a lot more wear on the left than on the right. So I got the left relatively flat um, I had you know blue front to back and then I went over and I checked this side and I was getting readings that showed <clears throat> either this was drooping a tremendous amount or this side had to be high so using some other techniques um, I, I determined that in fact this side was high this side was high <clears throat> by almost two thousandths higher than that side because this has a wider bearing surface. This has a narrower bearing surface and a gib. Um, 
So, yeah, it makes sense. That would have one more. Well, one more thing. Um, somebody assured me, in fact, that two people um, told me, that this surface, if it hasn't been milled, machined, or badly damaged, that it's a relatively good surface to use as a reference for the, uh, for the ways that because they're, they're cut they're milled at the same time this is finished scraped and this is not but they are milled at the same time so they should be in the same plane so it's a relatively relatively decent reference so I checked that I, uh, I put my surface gauge up here with an indicator to this surface and lo and behold sure enough they track true that I can go from front to, to here, now there's a relief cut here, which is really annoying and for, quite frankly really pisses me off and I don't understand why they would do that. I mean, obviously Bridgeport must have had a reason, but you can't use this area for reference because they, they, it's undercut two three thousandths. And then this again. And sure enough, if I go from, from back to front, I, I find that I'm within... I'm under a thousandth of an inch now between the, the two. But whatever curve, whatever movement has occurred in the top of this knee has also occurred here. So I still can't use this reference. This still does not gauge upright when I take the saddle over there and I put it on this surface because my, uh, my straight edge is telling me that this surface and this surface are still just a tiny bit higher than the center. But if I use if I use the uh, this method, it tells me it's it, it tells me it's flat. And if I when I put the um, <clears throat> obviously when I put the saddle up on here, and this is giving me a nice big red area telling me that this is nice and flat and parallel to that side. Um, so I'm, I'm not getting contradictory readings, but I'm getting confusing readings. I'm, I'm getting information that, you know, at, it's, at least indicates that I'm, I'm high in here and i got to take that down in order to get the saddle to transfer red to this area without without changing the height. I just need to, to tip this in a little bit. But, so that's what we're going to do. Okay. Okay, so while I'm scraping this, let me just uh, add this little segment because I, I a long time ago I <clears throat> mentioned that I use a technique that uh, I did not learn from Richard King of uh, flat scraping. And flat scraping is you're not scraping for points, you're not scraping for, for oil retention, you're scraping for a really, really flat surface, like a reference surface, which is, if I come over to my, um, my straight edge, and I come down, and if you can see it, you can see how, well, it's all, it's, it doesn't look that nice right now, because I've got blue all over it, and it looks kind of greasy, but um, it's really flat. It's not scraped like you would scrape for a machine way with little pockets to hold oil. It's scraped to be flat, almost like it was surface ground, um, or be but better. So anyway, that's flat scraping. And when I do that, I use a straight side of, this is, this is actually, this is actually what you're supposed to use for, for scraping, which is the the radius end. Well, I sharpened, I sharpened the uh, flat side, and I, I took the corners off. I rounded the corner. I put a little radius on the corner so I don't cut. Um, and there's two ways to use that. You can use that either with pushing or pulling. Um, I've used it both ways. The caution, show it like this. The caution uh, is that you can't let this build up with uh, filings and uh, debris. You see like on the, on the edge there, there's that little bit of debris. 
you got to keep wiping it off because you will get you will make scratches if you let the debris get caught between the blade and the work so you got to keep wiping it off and um, I'm push scraping now and I'm doing this to catch that ridge I remember I said there was a ridge on the inside here that I need to get rid of so when I'm flat scraping as opposed to scraping with a radius blade when I'm flat scraping I can feel when I hit that ridge because the rest of the blade is referenced on this surface out here which is a little lower and so I'm sort of biasing I'm leaning a little bit on the, on on the inside of the blade I'm, I'm tipping the blade slightly putting a little more weight you might say on the inside of the blade so it's following this surface and is cutting on the inside and I can actually feel when I hit that ridge and uh, I can see it come down I can actually see as I'm approaching the the height of the surrounding area out here which has been scraped to a, a lower level so it's a little more selective it gives you a little more feedback and if I get the angle of the camera here just right you can see here's where I'm not scraping out here or maybe I'm just touching in a few spots and obviously along right here I'm, I'm, I'm cutting pretty heavily because that's the ridge that's the ridge that came up all red when I slid the saddle back and if I come back over here I've got lots of red and purple because it's flat here but this is the high spot here so it's lifting it's lifting my my saddle and I'm not getting any contact out here at all because that's where I'm lifting so I need to get that down in the front and in the back so flat scraping not a technique to use for a way if you're going to have oil but for this it's very useful because it tells me it tells me quicker where my high spots are and how I am taking them down relative to the surface around it now once I get this you know flattened out a little more and level to where I want it then I'll go back with the radi with a radius blade probably on the uh, biax and I will go back and do my checkerboard and get my little pockets for oil and all of that um, I'm still basically rough scraping here if you look back in my my uh, video my my part one video of uh, the planing of the Bridgeport parts at in, in Reese's shop you will see the surface um, you will see some of the uh, scraping on on Reese's machines they have uh, very large um, cross hatches and it almost looks like uh, it's, it's kind of the pattern you get out of like a uh, flake board if you look at a, a, a piece of uh, uh, flake board on the side of a house you get you know big irregular shaped flakes um, and it, it's got that sort of a pattern not this little checkerboard pattern but a, a larger it, it's very I, I like it I, I think it looks really nice and it, you know it works for him and and, uh, and that's kind of what you see here you see uh, you see larger larger areas much larger areas that were done with the flat blade so flat scraping there you go um, you can see where I've, I've taken that ridge down and I've brought it out see where these two score lines are two deep scores which I probably won't ever get out but I've taken it down and you don't see any of the little pockets it's very very flat too shiny here here we go so you can see it's very very flat very wide look how wide that is it's almost a half an inch wide that scrape very very wide flat scrapes no no pockets I feel I run this this is a carbide tip in this pen it's not a pencil um, I run my I run I haven't I haven't stoned this yet but I run this little pointy carbide tip in here I don't feel anything absolutely nothing it's flat very large wide little wide that is see how wide that scrape is super flat so now we're gonna blow it up my eye does look at this all I did was scrape in that corner and uh, I re-blew it 
and look at the blue. Inside to outside. Where's that glare coming from? Oh, I know where it is. It's the overhead light. Um, but, uh, yeah. If you can see the blue, it's... That's a little better. It's pretty good. Pretty good. Little flat, that is. Wow. Um... Yeah, so I got blue front, middle, back, inside, outside. So we're really close. We're really close. And that was just one scraping. That was just just dealing with with that high spot back in there and a little bit up here in the front and uh, some some more high spot back in back in here actually that I scraped. And there was a blue spot there, and all of this came in. All of this turned blue now. And all of this came in. So that spot and that spot back there was lifting was lifting the whole um, straight edge. And I was just getting a little a little blue out in here. Now you see some of that blue. My lighting is really not happy here. Um some of that blue has rocked in. I've actually lost some blue in here, which is fine. Which is fine. So yeah, we're getting really close. So um, different uh, different techniques, but I'm very happy to see that come in now, like that. So now I'm going to go back and uh, we're going to we're going to get some red on the saddle. And slide the saddle there and see if we can't get a little bit uh, more spread. Um, I'm going to do the other side first. I'm going to get the other side like this. and I'm going to check for height differences first. I'm going to do a few things before I get the saddle back on it. But uh, we know where we're going. We're on the right track. Okay, so we'll, we'll leave it there. I've got, um, I've got an upcoming... Uh, would you call it a rant? What channel update? Uh, an upcoming channel update on uh, things um, things that have been going on, things I've done. And, and I got viewer mail. You believe it? Holy mackerel. I got 300 subscribers and I got viewer mail. Um, so I did have a, a very nice gentleman over in, uh, in New York State sent me uh, something for the surface grinder that I want to share with you. And um, I'm sorry, not my surface grinder, my tool post grinder. But... Um, yeah, it's been uh, it's it's been a blast. It's been a, it's good winter, so I want to get you guys all caught up on that. So we'll have that coming up soon. So again, as always, thank you very much for watching. Please, uh, you know, share, and tell your friends, and um, I hope you all uh, have an enjoyable spring. And uh, we say our prayers for the uh, for all the people in the world who are at this time suffering between the, uh, the shootings in New Zealand and the floods in the Midwest and all the other trials and tribulations going on in the world, uh, you're all in our thoughts and prayers. Bye for now.